computer recording each segment. So we welcome Daniel O. Black. I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie and... This is Stephanie Freeman. Welcome to my, my segment of The Cavalcade. Uh, I am the author of a series called Diamonds, Blood and Shadows. My first installment is called Necessary Evil and I am happy to introduce Dr. Daniel O. Black. Wow. Well, thank you, I'm glad to be here. Well, we are honored by your presence and your energy. Um, Dr. Black is a renowned award-winning novelist with a PhD in African-American studies. His works include, They Tell Me of a Home, The Sacred Place, Perfect Peace, 12 Gates to the City, and now The Coming and Listen to the Lambs. In 2014, he won a Distinguished Writers Award from the Mid-Atlantic Writers Association for Perfect Peace, oh, excuse me, for Perfect Peace, the GOG National Book Club community named him as its author of the year in 2011. Welcome, welcome to the Cavalcade, sir. We are so glad to have you here. Oh my goodness. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Okay, let's, let's jump right in. Um, tell us about your journey to publication. Oh, wow. Okay. I started writing my first novel, The Chairman of a Home, when I was in graduate school. And I, I had to put it aside in order to do that famous thing called a dissertation. So I did that, but then I picked it back up once I finished the dissertation. And I'm one of those writers who, you know, I, um, I finished They Tell Me of a Home and I sent it to several agents and I got picked up and they sent it to St. Martin's Press and St. Martin's Press grabbed it. And, you know, we, we, we've been in publication ever since then. So um, tell me about your process. I mean, are you an early morning writer, late in the evening writer? What kind of writer are you? What do you what's your, your process? Sure. I'm a, I'm a, anytime I can get five minutes. Writer. Okay. 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 Are you yeah, an I can, or I can write anytime. Yeah. 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 I can write any time of day or night. If I just have the time I can write. Wow. Now there, there is something right there. Finding the time. Sometimes yeah. it's just like I was saying earlier, you, you, you long for extra your hours in the day but you're only given 24. That's right. That's right. Uh, and time management is is crucial. I mean, what it are is. some of your time management things? What do you do? Well, I tend to be a very disciplined man. So, um I can be rather rigid in terms of my life in terms of my scheduling. I'm a full-time professor at Clark Atlanta University and at Morehouse College and so I do I do all my teaching and I'm the church choir director. So, just, so you know, I do lots and lots of things. But I also sleep eight hours a night as a rule um, because you know the rest just produces a better quality mind and better quality product. Um, but typically when I'm in writing mode, as I call it, typically I will write five, six hours a day, every single day, just as a rule. Wow. Um, I, feel a, I feel attacked. <laughs> <laughs> well, he say he gets eight as a rule because if I'm like, uh, what's eight hours? <laughs> oh yeah, I have to, I have to because because the quality of what you produce when the mind is tired is different than when the mind is rested. You know, yeah. you know, and I and I tell folks and I tell people this all the time. Even God rested. You know. Well now. So you know, well, God needs rest. Certainly, so do we. So. Okay. Um, I tend to write quite, quite rigidly when I'm in writing mode. When I finish a book, I'll generally take a month or two, well, a month, and kind of let my mind breathe, you know, kind of step back from it. But typically, I'm, I'm writing several things at once, so I'm always in, in that writing mode, yeah. So what's, on, what's in your writer's library? What's, what's a go-to book that's in there that, you, you know, if you're starting... Maybe you're working on dialogue or plotting or, you know, world building. What's your go-to? I'm, I'm one of those readers. I read, I keep seeing people putting in the chat, oh my God, perfect piece. He wrote perfect piece. He wrote, you know, uh, I, um, I typically read five or six or seven books simultaneously. I'm one of those people, oh. right? 
So I'm always, in, I'm always, I have a work station in my living room that is, that is covered with books and that's always covered with books. And I have dear friends who try to move my books out of the way and try to, you know, set my books in, in, in a very ordered fashion. And then, you know, I have to mess it up again. But um, I am one who typically reads seven or eight books at a time. And right now I'm, I'm, really, I'm reading Ernest Gaines quite heavily. Mm. I'm an Ernest Gaines fan. Yeah, I really, really like Ernest Gaines. I like Marilyn Robinson. I don't know if you know that name. But um, I'm reading a lot of Marilyn Robinson these days. I'm reading a lot of Edwige Danticat these days. Um, I just, um, I was, I'm reading Eddie Glaude's uh, Begin Again, which talks about James Baldwin. You know, I, I, I tend to, to be a kind of a rather scholarly sort of reader, right? And so I read um, 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 scholarly research kind of books as well as fiction, uh, of course. And um, and then and one other book that that I've been reading, well, that I read that I really liked is I'm reading a lot of Kaise Lehman. Of course, most people heard of Heavy, you know, that collection of heavy, uh, of essays, which is fantastic, just amazing. And so these books have really just, you know, kind of been dancing in my consciousness for the last month or two. Nice. So are you a plotter or a pantster? Are you the type of person that has to outline or? You know, I really wish I could outline actually, but I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm the writer who I close my eyes and I open my laptop and it pours from my head into the computer. Nice. Yeah, in fact, I wish I could outline because then, then, I, then I can make characters do what I prefer, you know, <laughs> I never can. And they have a tendency to run roughshod over you sometimes. It's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. Okay, let's see. Um... Well, I was going to say, ask you what p book in particular, but seven books at a time. My goodness, how can you keep it all straight without I, a cup I, of coffee? It, it, it never, the characters never cross in my head. Okay. Yeah. They never, they never cross. Wow. Wow. My goodness. Um, let's see. Does anyone from, from the tribe have a question? Perfect, please one of your most controversial books to date. You know, now we're finding more uh, stories, um, real life stories of uh, transgender right. and these sort of thing and how you were able to project a today issue and have it happen in the time period in which Perfect Peace existed. What was the rationale and thought process behind putting Perfect Peace together? Well, you know, the first thing that's interesting is, of course, Perfect Peace is exactly 10 years old now. Um, so, I, so I see now that I was just a bit ahead of the curve, I think, mm -hmm. with Perfect Peace and talking about gender issues and trans issues, et cetera, that now, you know, are everywhere in, in our social consciousness. But I think the, the, the thing I was most interested in at the time was looking not only at gender and sexuality issues, but looking at it when black people were first confronted with it, which is why I set the book in the 1940s, right? I wanted to look at it when a black, a rural black community first had its engagement with this notion of difference in gender and sexuality and what in the world did black people do with this level of difference and this kind of challenge, right? Um, and how, how did black people respond? And uh, what did black response look like? You know, was it healing? Was it affirming? Was it abusive? Was it violent? And the truth of the matter is it was, it was all of that. And I wanted us in some ways to begin as a black people, as a black community, to have this conversation about gender and sexuality, about trans possibility, so that we could begin not just to get usurped by um, um, Westerners who were having the conversation, but so that we as black people were having the conversation in, in and of ourselves, right? Because issues of gender and sexuality appear of course in the black community too, outside of any issues of whiteness. And so I really wanted black people to wrestle with this issue for the sake of a safer and a more wonderful and a more loving black community. Yeah, lots of folks have read that book, it seems. Yeah, that, that is the one that, to me, for me, that puts you on the map. And here's the thing, I'm still pissed to this day because I have not read the last page. 
my you know, last page of perfect peace. Right. Last, last two, three pages, because my agent came over and and she took it and I didn't know realize it. Um and I never got it back. I don't oh, loan my books, but I'm just saying, like to this day, and I'm it hits me. And that because now I would have to read the whole thing again. But then you had so many other deep books come out. The coming. The coming. Wow. The coming. The coming. That one was painful. And the thing is. I still haven't made it through all of that. Oh, wow. It is a, it's heart wrenching. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's painful on a soul level, but it's deep and it's a voice and it's a story that has never been told anywhere else. That's but right. if you, you know, just like we do in fiction, we put ourselves in the story. Yes, yes, You yes. put us in the holes of that slave ship. Yes. You put us in that mindset. That's a, we already are experiencing trauma on a, on a, from racism and, and all of these things that are happening today. This is a, this is one one thousandth of what our ancestors experienced. And when you walked us through the middle passage on that level, ah, oh, yeah, yeah. It, I have to be on an extreme upswing to tackle that because that's some deep stuff right there. It is. Yeah. It is, I, it, what was that um, museum? It was in, um, in Michigan. There's a African museum where they have the physical representation. Oh yes, 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 yes. It took me a minute to step over that threshold physically and they have the sounds playing in the background and all of these things. It's, and I didn't think I could, it could get worse in that experience. But when you have somebody captured with the written word for that period of time. And it's like a train wreck. You want to keep going. You know you need to keep going because you need to know this. You got to know this. Right. It hurts. It, yeah. hurts in the it does hurt. It does hurt. But the truth of the matter is you can't write about the middle passage nicely. No. You know, the middle passage by design and by definition is a story of trauma and pain, inconceivable, incomprehensible. And so... It had to be that. But in this case, in this case, it is the Africans themselves in the belly of the ship telling the story, not modern day historians talking about them. They are telling the story themselves about what they felt, what they understood, how they loved one another, how they how they created peace in the middle of the dark, how how they sang songs, how they created hymns uh, in order to 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 obfuscate the limitations of language. It's it's the way in which these Africans uh, present themselves as full fledged human beings, not just cargo on a ship, you know, and. And this book has done extremely well, I'm happy to say. But you're right, everybody that reads it says, good Lord, you almost killed me, right? But I'm happy about that because that then means that for the first time, you didn't get to encounter the middle passage, right? As a distant observer. Mm -hmm. You had to ride the boat this time. You know, the ma'afa is just too important for us to stem back from at a distance. You, you, you have to get on the ship in order to understand it. And that is our inheritance. That's really, that's really the birthplace of the African-American is on this slave ship. And so we have to know that historical moment, I think. You are correct. I mean, and, and, and what made you feel that you needed to tell that story? I did not at all feel that I needed to tell that story. Ancestors visited that story upon me. In fact, I was writing, I was in the middle of a listen to the lambs. I was, I was 200 pages deep into another book when, when, when the coming began to visit itself upon me. But I realized later that that book had to be written because as black people in America and as people of African descent, we, we weren't owning this story as a part of our triumph and a part as a part of our achievement. Many people knew of the historical reality of the Middle Passage, but we weren't we weren't then, and many of us are now are, are not now. We're not calling ourselves Africans. We're not we're not connecting to these individuals as if this is my mama, as if this is my grandfather. We're too many black people are reading about these people who were cargo on a ship also with no real visceral, no real emotional connection to them at all. And I feel like these ancestors were saying um, for our own children, 
not to be co connected to us emotionally is, is a historical insult. And I, you know, with one who has a PhD in African-American studies, and I've spent 15 years reading about and studying the Middle Passage, I think that's probably why they chose me. How many times have we heard in, in, in what, in the news today, people say, well, I'm not my ancestors. Of course we are. They're, they're in the yeah. yeah. out there who let, we are. Let him speak to that. Let him speak to that. When you hear that online, we are not our ancestors. I'm that's, the, that's the most unintelligent thing I've ever heard of in life. That's, I agree. I agree. Me, that's like an acorn look, looking at a tree and saying, I am not a tree. Well, now. Right? Uh, I, I think that's unintelligent. And it's insulting because the truth of the matter is you can't be stronger than those who came before you. Right? I think young people are trying to say like, you know, I won't take the bullshit, if you will, that, that my ancestors took being nice. I ain't like that, I'm gonna fight. But what they don't understand is black people have always fought. Black people have always sacrificed. Black people have always given their all. And the truth of the matter is staying consistent by working, chopping cotton 15 hours a day. That is harder than to shoot somebody in the street. So I'm saying that to say, I think people, young people are saying that who have no idea the price their ancestors paid. Because if you did, there's no way you could ever say that. Exactly, exactly. The only reason we're here is because they were. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. They're, they're tied into the fabric of our being. They are our DNA. And for someone Absolutely. to make a, a comment like that so, so carelessly. You know, they think that they're saying something that, that's profound and deep into, it's like they're dismissing sure. everything. Sure, now there is one mistake I think that African elders have made and almost every generation made it. And it's a huge mistake. And that is 90% of African elders, parent, black parents, we tell our children to be better than us. Mm -hmm. We tell our children to go and do something better than us. I did. We tell our children have a greater life than I did. And, and what that is suggesting is that we as the elders, we as the parents are not the excellent example our children should follow. And I'm suggesting that what we should tell our children is you go to class as excellently as I've gone to work. Mm. You study in the library as excellently as I've cooked for you every single day of your life. You do that, young man. You do that, young woman. But what I'm, and unfortunately, we've not used ourselves as the model and the example of the excellence we want our children to follow. We tell our children, my parents told me too, I want you to have a better life than I had. How is that possible? Sometimes they mean material things, but material things does not produce excellence. It's temporary. A bigger house has not made more honorable children. Amen. I mean, it's all temporary. Job, people, material things, it's all temporary. It's, it's what you instill in your children that matters, that yep. they pass it on, and that they're good people, that they help someone else along on the journey. Sure. sure. That's and, what when parents, and when parents tell us, be better than me, then what they don't know is we're sending our children to someone else, to another people to follow. Mm -hmm. We definitely. Does anyone else in the in the tribe want to ask a question before we um, before we close? I have a question. First of all, welcome, Professor Black. Thank you. I've not read uh, the coming, and I'm a little bit apprehensive because I am an older person who has picked cotton as a child in South Carolina, uh, and I have read the Black Book which traumatized me mm. tremendously. So what should I do to prepare myself uh, to read the coming, having experience, <clears throat> excuse me, having experienced as a woman in her seventies that a lot of these younger tribe members have not experienced without it revisiting that trauma upon me. Because I was attacked as a 10 year old in Williamson, South Carolina, which really, uh, led me to 
to disavow my brother who I thought should have helped me. Instead, he was kowtowing you know, to the white man. I was grown before I realized that he saved my life that day. So racism has a lot of tentacles that, you know, if you're not careful, if you don't know any better, that will shape your intellect even up into your 70s, because right. I'm now located in North Carolina and I refuse to say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, because of that one incident. So I want to prepare myself to read this book without really getting angry, vindictive, because as I'm listening to the conversation around, it's, it's just, I'm regurgitating all these bad experiences that I had. Sure. Which are well, not I, as bad as what my ancestors had. Sure. I, I would say two things. Number one, you cannot avoid, nor should you avoid the anger. You must have it. The anger is part of our inheritance. So the book is going to make you angry. In fact, if it didn't, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, if white folks read this book and if it doesn't make them angry, something's wrong too, right? It should make any human being furious, right? But the other thing I would tell you that I would tell all of us is the thing black people have not done well in this country is that we have not done our healing rituals. Mm. We step over trauma trying to continue to survive. We step over trauma trying to make sure we can still go to work. You, you know what I mean? We step over trauma trying to do all the things necessary, right, in order for us to live, right? However, however, the notion of sitting in the middle of the trauma and speaking the truth of it and speaking the you know, the dimensions of it is so important, but it's so painful that what we try to do is do a little piece of it so we can just move on. But moving on means we never really deal with it fully. And so it revisits itself upon mm. every generation, right? Um, and the thing too is what happens in the coming is that the ancestors tell you how to heal. See, their truth about what happened to them is part of actually your healing. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they tell you that we were not just cargo. We were not just slaves that somebody put in the belly of a ship. Magical, marvelous, healing, brilliant dancers, doctors, right? Who, uh, who people captured. But all the brilliance of who we ever were came along with us, right? They did not strip Africa of us. They stripped us out of Africa. But Africa came along with the body and the flesh. So the irony is the, those same Africans who, with whom we are traumatized, they also turn around and heal us. Well, thank you for that. Because yes, like I said, I'm, I'm up here in age now and sometimes I get really angry, especially when I see our young people with the pants sagging, you know, yes, and they don't want to go to school. And I'm thinking about how I didn't even go to school every day because when it was cotton picking time, right. that right. truck with the sl wooden slats on the side would come right. by and all the little black kids would get in it right. and go pick cotton. So yes, I've sir. experienced that. Sure. And I'm trying sure. to, you know, and I guess it's my delivery because I get real angry when one of the grandkids don't want to do the homework or something like that. And I'm thinking, do you help realize how lucky, how fortunate you are? Right. And no, they don't realize it. And some of the reason they don't realize it is because we, and I'm included in this too, we shielded our children too excellently. We saved them from the truth of who we are. And by doing that, we stripped them of any historical consciousness. See, we wanted our children not to struggle the way you're saying you did. Yes. But the truth is we should have absolutely made them struggle because struggle is what makes a person reach further. If there's no yearning in a child, a child is going to sit down and do nothing. But see, what we thought, what we thought was true is that if we gave our children every reason to prosper, then they would. They would have no reason not to prosper. But it's not true. It is not true that if you make life easy for a person, they do more. In fact, it's true that if you make life easy, they'll do far less. Amen. By the time I had the 14th grandchild, I learned that. <laughs> yeah, we, 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 we learned, I learned it. to say no. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons I wrote The Coming too, as a gift to a young generation mm -hmm. so that they would understand that if, if you're tall, it's because the shoulders you stand upon are big. Daniel? Wow. 
I have a, I want to pose something to you because I think it needs to be addressed and I think you're the perfect person to address it. There's all these times that white and black uh -huh. say this when it comes to how we were enslaved. Well, Africans sold you into slavery too. I'd like for you to address that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. First of all, the world over had systems of serfdom, right? And serfdom was the, these, these systems whereby when one could not pay a debt, you would have to work off your debt with someone else, right? Now, it may take you seven or eight years to work off your debt, right? And Africa had systems of serfdom, absolutely, right? Like most other continents on the planet. So that, yes, one might have to be... Um, um, one might be in serfdom to a particular person because they owe a debt, and it may take you years. But what chattel slavery, which is the form the West introduced, right, the form that European countries imposed upon Africa, the form of chattel slavery was the destruction of your being in exchange for your labor. In serfdom, they could not disturb your being. Nobody stripped you of your name. They didn't brand you. They didn't, they didn't quip your body. You simply had to work off your debt. Chattel slavery was the very destruction of your very identity in order for you to become a labor and in order for you to become property for another human being. And not only is that the difference, that's a humongous difference. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So we can Thank easily, so I can easily make this statement that the, the Africans who sold their brothers and sisters or uh, rival tribes or whatever, they were not aware that they were selling us into the kind of slavery that was so vastly different. That's right. From the form that was in Africa itself. That's right. That's right. They, they had no notion they were selling folks into chattel slavery. They didn't know somebody was going to take them to a whole nother planet or, 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 or on the other side of the world. They had no notion of that. In fact, there are instances of kings and, and, and other folks in Africa who once they learned that it was chattel slavery, that um, one king, in fact, committed suicide for what now he had participated in beyond his knowing. Because of course, in the African sense, it's like, who does that? <laughs> you know, like, how do you even commodify flesh? How do you translate a person's body into dollars and cents? Like, how do you determine the value of a human life? They had no precedent for, for any community, for any nation that had ever or could ever do such a thing. And so the coming is, this whole psychological, you know, slavery was a physical thing, yes, but it was a psychological trauma as well. It was an emotional trauma as well. It was an aesthetic trauma as well, right? Which I'm beginning to teach folks about now too, because they didn't take every African they saw. They picked certain Africans. But what we have to admit is they picked certain Africans for, for certain phenotypes and certain physicalities that they thought would excite the, West, the Western white imagination. Hmm. They wanted us for labor, but they wanted us for pleasure also. Hmm. Ooh. I was not ready for this. Okay. <laughs> I was. Or did I go too heavy? I, I was. No, no. no. This is okay. I hope I never get too old to learn. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I never want to be, because like you said, you said something that like just freed me. I have been so angry over that one incident that happened when I was 10. And I'm almost 73 now that it has blocked a lot of what you said. And I feel almost like crying. Wow. But at the same time, I feel freed. Wow. Yes. Because I didn't know what to call it. Yes. 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 And I had never heard anybody express it the way that you have. Wow. And the way you broke it down. Yes, ma'am. It's like bomb. Just yes, went over me. I'm so honored. So now I can go downstairs and take my grandson with the sagging pants and put my arms around him and say, you know what? I'm praying that you do better. Absolutely. Instead of looking at him every time, just getting disgusted, thinking, look at all this that you're wasting. And so see, I this, have to thank you for that. Oh, yes, ma'am. Oh, you're going to make me cry. Man. But see, and the sagging pants, the sagging pants does not subtract from the value of who he is. I know, but see, I subtracted it. That's right. That's right. I subtracted it based That's on right. my own experience, right. not his. Right. 
but mine, because yes, I already know what the end will be if it's not changed. Yes, ma'am. But I'm not giving him the tools and the love to want to change. That's right. Instead, I'm criticizing, and I, I'm from this point on, I'm owning that. Oh, amen. Mm -hmm. Wow. Woo. I got to tell you, there's a sign on my door that says, friends welcome, family by appointment. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I mean that thing because, you know, I, I just see what's going to happen if they don't change, but I have not seen what I can do. That's right. To help that change. That's right. That's right. And, and I'm going to tell you. It won't be easy. No, it won't be easy. I'm going to tell you that, that what just happened to you just now is, in fact, that is our salvation. I've been mentoring kids for 30 years and black boys who pants sag in all of this. And if you will love the, well, what we're talking about, if you love the spirit in them, they'll pull up their own pants. What wow. we've been trying to do, we've been trying to figure out how to fix them. Ex hey, do you, does somebody feel what I'm, we've been trying to figure out how to fix them externally. Right. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Repair, repair them internally and they'll pull up their own pants. Wow. Well, I, yeah, you understand? I thank you. I wish I could hug you, but I uh -huh. <laughs> So I'm going to give you a virtual hug. Yes, ma'am. I'll hug you. Thank we you. all are. Yes, we all are. Yes. Wow. Thank you all <laughs> so much. I think my time is up, isn't it? It is up. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is, you know, we're going to do something else next month, um, leading from Black Friday to Cyber Monday, uh, shorter days of, of time. I would love to have you back. I'll send you the email. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, because I think we need to give you a longer spread of time yes. uh, than this uh, to talk about those issues of racism. Wow. I think we should open up that, that uh, town hall with you. I've been wanting to ask those questions wow. for a minute because even when people say, well, well, I wanna go see Africa and I'm like, I'm a little pissed off at what they did to us. They did this and, and including everybody else, but when your own hurts you, and current carrying that people carry church hurt. Right, that's right. But see, Africans never did what Europeans did. Exactly. Never. That's because never. we don't know. And I didn't know, which is why I asked that question. I needed to ask that question for me. That's right. Yes, ma'am. And I'm sure there's a whole lot of other people who were thinking that or have that in mind because they want to say, well, I, the first thing that a lot of people, that's right. I, I, people I, throw I up is, a million well, times. I told y'all into slavery and then, and you keep hearing that and you think about it. How did they make, how do these white folks go over there and make off with so many of us? What was- See, part, what of the issue, part of the issue, Nayla, it, part of the issue is that we as black people carry such subconscious self-hatred that we keep trying to figure out, right? How to always blame ourselves for anything that's ever happened to us. Mm -hmm because the self-hatred is already there. So we, we're always trying to explain how, how we were at fault and how we went wrong, which is why our ability to cr critique each other is far easier and far more mastered than our ability to praise each other. Mm. That is, wow. I'm that sorry. is powerful, <laughs> powerful. We're going to have you back because we've got to explore Please. more of this. I should have known, but we gave everybody the same amount of time. Cause yes, we, and I don't want to take anybody else's time. There's some people who don't know who you are. They live in, I wouldn't say they live in under a rock, but this one, there are people from Australia, Switzerland, all over that signed up to be part of this. So wow. we're ed, you're educating us, but you're education, educating others. And when this clip goes out, we're going to put these, review, these um, interviews out on YouTube. My son is creating the channel for that. I think we're going to get a lot of people who are, are familiar, become familiar with more of our black griot, our right. African griot, right. our, uh, our stories. And that's, right. that's what the cavalcade is about. You know, there's I some say. people who have the romance, there's some people who yes. come with the deep stuff. And yes. right now we're going to, we're transitioning over to our young griot who's, who's writing books for our, uh, um, the Christian fiction, as well as for young adult. And that's Chandra Sparks. But I'm going to say, Daniel, where can people catch up with you, where can they find out more about you? Absolutely. Uh, let me say this very quickly. Every single Friday evening at 6.30, I am on Facebook Live doing a spiritual lesson. Facebook Live, Friday evening, 6.30. I've been doing it since March. Every single Friday. If you missed the back ones, they're all on YouTube, right? 
So uh, Friday evening, 6.30, Facebook Live. I'm always there. My, my, um, my website is danieloblack.com. Danieloblack.com. I'm not huge on social media because I'm always writing in some, right? I'm, I'm not big on social media. But, but um, through Facebook, I can always, 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 always communicate. Um, if someone wants to get in touch with me, my email address is Baba Omo, B A B A O M O, Baba Omo at AOL.com. That's the one I use for correspondences, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so thank you all for having me. This has just been absolutely magnificent. And, um, and Chandra Sparks, hello to you. Hello, Daniel. <laughs> How are you? I'm, I'm trying to get out of the way. <laughs> no, I just want to share this last visual for people to know what books to pick up because now they can put the drop this in their libraries and thank you so much if you want to stick around all you have to do is stop uh video Daniel and you'll be put in the panelist queue and you can still watch everything okay so okay okay great 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 so thanks much. Paul okay thank you